Hey GP learners and welcome to this session where we're going to be going through our various top tips for new locums to help you manage 2021. I know we're a little bit into it but don't worry we've got lots of cool tips and things that you can cover and understand to help you understand how basically general practice works in this weird mid post COVID phase. I don't know we're joined by Dr Serena Chibber and we're going to get started right now. And she's still bopping away, as you can see. <laughs> how are you doing, Serena? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good, Candy. How are you? I'm not too bad. As you can see, in clinic, literally just finished the triage from the morning. I think that was about 35 odd patients having to get through, but managed to get through it. And yeah, one more to call, but I can deal with that a bit later because it's a non-urgent thing. But yeah, keen to see what we can do to help all of our locum team out there and, and stuff, and what we can do for them. But shall I? Yeah. Tell us about why you're here, first of all. Yeah, so we, you and I ran quite a popular webinar similar to this um, mm -hmm. almost a year ago now. I can't believe it. And um, so I've kind of been meeting lots of GP trainees who are about to qualify, who were like, oh, we watched it or, you know, we're kind of finishing now. Could you guys do something similar again? And I was like, mm -hmm. well, Dr. G, he's a very busy man, but I'll see what I can do. So then I thought, okay, let's let's do this. Let's do it again because it was so popular. So I think this really is a, a really good summary of top tips for any ST3 who's about to embark on, you know, kind of general practice and is going to be doing locum work or working flexibly or maybe they're going to be a salary GP and do extra ad hoc sessions. Maybe they want to do some urgent care out of hours. Basically, because the landscape has changed so much with COVID, mm -hmm. I thought, I, why not? Why don't we like get together and do a, a, a another event? And just as my background for people that don't know me, I'm Serena and I'm a GP. I'm a co I'm co-founder of My Local Manager, which is a very popular toolkit used by. It's a platform used by GPs to work flexibly and work as locums. And this mm -hmm. year we've got. NHS approval to become an NHS approved platform for ICSs. So I know lots of areas are going to be seeing us launch, launch across the areas imminently now. So it's super exciting. Um, mm. So there's not much about locuming that I don't know, just because I have yep. only ever locumed. And um, that's been my my livelihood, really. So I understand the challenges very well. I understand the reservations that GPs have of um bank work or agency work or um, not having that continuity and support. And that's kind of what I built in to, um, to MLM, to my local manager, to help kind of navigate those pitfalls. So are you ready to get Absolutely started? Absolutely ready, yep. And hopefully what people get, obviously, is that dual perspective. So also your perspective as yeah. a local, mine as a GP partner, and as yeah. you're sort of going to chuck in loads of hints and tips into this as well, as well as various resources that you can access now, whatever, you know, to, to help in terms of managing locum life shall we say um and yeah. if you do have any questions watching us live um so obviously i know there are some people out there watching us live feel free to ask questions as we go along we'll come to yeah, them as we, as we go through it and stuff if you're watching this on the replay say hi for team replay um but also yeah feel free to still put some questions and stuff into the comments i'll i'll be able to direct them to serena after the event or answer them myself if needs be Great. so we have got ourselves some slides and stuff to kick us off um mm -hmm. and yeah we're just going to talk about basically you know all those top tips you need to know um there we go and that's us too as you can see serena looking far better than i am in my slightly weird pointing at your face. head yeah, pointing at my head, just pointing out my slightly thinning patch, which is never good. But hey, say la vie. That's life, isn't it? So we're going to get started by talking about how to get started with being a locum. Um, and then, yeah, Serena, you're going to uh, take over. Yeah, so, so I think what we're going to try and cover is all the popular questions you and I were asked kind of from last time and all the, all the questions that I've been asked on all the VTS workshops I've been doing. So how do you get started? And this is this event is for, as Gandhi said, you might be a partner, a salary GP, or want you to be a full-time locum. We're going to cover tips to help you navigate. If you're CCTing this year, this, this event will kind of help get you started yeah. on all aspects of it. The different types of work available, you know, like some people don't want to do ad hoc work. They, they're looking for maternity locums, long-term locum. They want to do some urgent care or 111 work. So we're going to talk about that. Um, negotiating T's and C's. And I think, Gandhi, this is where your perspective as a partner 
is mm. really useful because I think um, GPs, yeah, sometimes they have a, um, I think just having that relationship with a practice is really important as opposed to having it very transactional. So we're going to talk a bit about that. Yeah. And often people get stumped by the financials of it. We're just going to just do a very quick summary. And we've got resources that you'll share in the show notes, which go through it in a lot more detail. Talking a bit about pay rates and live Q&A. And you're also kindly going to cover tech tips and new ways of working and just basically how to be super organized and have a structured clinic run to time and, and your top tips for that. So it should be action packed. Fingers crossed. Right. So first up, we've got all this information here. There's loads of stuff that you've been up to. Yes, this really is my CV, essentially. So kind of as a GP after qualifying, I set up my local manager. It very quickly grew to a national platform used by thousands of GPs who aren't they're not just locums. They're, some of them are portfolio GPs. Some of them are partner salary GPs, but they like our system because of the wraparound support it gives plus mm -hmm. all the tech that sorts out all the admin, all your bookings and everything else. And I'm involved in lots of other different roles as well. Um, I was Macmillan GP, Right for Pulse, work with GP Update, lots of different things. Cool. And that's me. Um, that's my video talking about website manner, which you're more than welcome to have a look at. It gives you your absolute top tips for how to do a video consultation and how absolutely not to do a video consultation. And if you want to see me making an absolute fool of myself, yeah, go have a look at it. Um, it's good fun. Um, That's so. my favourite ones of your your webinars. It always has me in stitches, and I always share it on the VTS talks. And it's just it sticks in your mind because it's just you kind of want to be that bad doctor sometimes. <laughs> you just don't have the guts. <laughs> I must admit, it was a lot of fun filming it because you know you get to act out those stereotypes that you hope never to see in practice, but kind of <laughs> always wanted to envisage and stuff. Yeah. So, We've not had any questions yet, but we're going to crack on with starting with preparing for work itself. So yeah. I guess these are your okay. top tips for preparing for work. Talk us through it. Serena. Yeah. So essentially, I think for those of you about to CCT, I know I've heard from a lot of um, GPs that I've kind of shared this link with. And a lot of you have said, oh, do you know what? Like because of the COVID challenges, my CCT date has been set back and I'm, mm. I'm not qualifying in August. I'm actually going to finish out of sync. And look, don't worry, it's been a really unsettling time worldwide with this pandemic. And it's, there has been huge disruption to people's training as a result of it in primary care. So what I would say is whether you're going to qualify in August or later on, whether it's been delayed, what you'll need for employment, actually, whether or not you're going to be a salary GP partner or locum is these key documents. And your CCT certificate, GMC and performers list is, um, happens you get signed off on your e-portfolio and then you get your CCT certificate, you get updated on the GMC and you pay them additional fee to be on the register. And then you need to update your status on uh, PCSE's website, but your educational supervisor will talk you through it. The reason why it's on here, just so you know, okay, these are the things I need to make sure I have. Mm -hmm. Certificate of indemnity covers on there because even though we all have crown indemnity now in place, I would strongly advise that you do call the three indemnity providers and pay that little bit more to get your own additional insurance on top of that, because that will provide you with cover for like any prof uh, professional um, issues or complaints that there might be, any complaints that, that come up that are related to non-NHS work that you might do, which in general practice, you might think, oh, I'm only going to do core NHS work, but actually a significant amount of what we do in the data isn't actually in the signing letters, marathon runs, triathlon, all these things, social letters, all these things mm -hmm. that end up being part of our work isn't actually NHS related work. It's just stuff we, we've ended up dealing with. So if there's anything that causes a complaint related to non-NHS work, that's what that additional payment of indemnity covers you for. Any mm -hmm. coroner cases, yep. And there's two big ones that aren't covered by Crown Indemnity that you absolutely want help and support yeah. for. Number one is coroner's reports. If you yeah. ever have to do one, you mm. definitely want indemnity support to do that because I know even though being a partner, I've done several coroner's yeah. reports. Do I? Yeah. The MDU, once they've gone through it with me, so I'm, I'm with the MDU, they've massively changed what I would have written and have saved me having to go stand in front of the coroner from my perspective, yeah. which is a stress you never want to have to deal with in that respect. The other one is the GMC as well yeah, so crown exactly. indemnity will not cover you for gmc investigations um mm. uh, and you will need indemnity for that so you're absolutely right it's uh, you know i know some people say well i don't need it i've got crown indemnity no you still need your yeah. own independent indemnity highly recommend you have it 
Yeah. And with um, your practice, so another question, I got sent a list of questions for our live webinar because a lot of trainees mm. are clinical or whatever, but they say, can you ask this and we'll watch the replay? So yeah. one question that came up was um, if for GPs that are taking on salaried roles, if the practice is saying, no, we'll cover you under our umbrella scheme, what's your advice about that? So I think if a practice is willing to do that, that's great. And particularly from a salary perspective, I think locums, mm. I, I struggle to see how they're going to make that work um, unless it is. A, a oh, no, locums will need it independently. Yeah. yeah. I guess um, if you're taking on a salaried role in a practice. Yeah, I think as long as your only role is with that practice, yeah. that's fine. It gets a yeah. little bit more complicated if your own role is, um, you know, if you're working across m multiple practices or if you're locuming on top, then it, it yeah. is more complicated because then you have to have multiple policies, which doesn't quite make sense. Mm. Um, often, you know, most employers will pay for the indemnity anyway. And if you're only yeah. working, for example, 50% in one practice, well, they'll, they'll pay for 50% of it. Yeah, so exactly. That's how it works. Yeah. So I guess the, the message is, if you're going to be doing different roles, so a bit of salary, a bit of locum, a bit of whatever, just pay for your own indemnity. It's also tax deductible, and it's so much cheaper now than it was um, before Crown Indemnity um, came in. I mean, it'll be a few hundred pounds um, compared to the tens of thousands that it was before. Okay. And then you'll need a valid DBS check, up-to-date immunisation record, um, two references and a copy of your passport for proof of eligibility to work in the UK. So have these documents ready. Um, if you're salaried, you can just save it as a PDF and, and have it together with your CV when you're approaching practices for work. If you're locum, you can upload it onto my locum manager or just save it when you're emailing or, or contacting practices. Um, but just have it there um, for your own, um, you know, have it together or, or ready for when you go. So this is just a quick one about CV tips. And um, Gandhi, it's going to be really good to get your insight as a partner view. So again, although this is for locums, I recognize that many GPs now take on a more sessional role. So you'll be applying for a salaried role and then doing locuming on top, or you'll mm -hmm. be doing locum work with other portfolio roles. So we're going to try and encompass that kind of multifaceted role that's kind of becoming more popular now, in which case your CV will be quite important for you when you're mm -hmm. applying for these different roles or applying for work. So there is a template that you can download on the resource section of my local manager for free and it's got this kind of setup so it starts off with career aspirations and my cv follows this format and i just have a couple of sentences when i qualified i had like my career aspirations at that time were i wanted to work more in flexible workforce i wanted to expand my role in medical education and a few other things and then i update it every few years and it's really interesting that when i look at my old cv and what I've, i'm like oh i actually did that in the end. it's almost like you set the intention and you mm. start realizing what you're interested in mm. i'd say if you're if you're putting together your cv before ccting um it's really you you don't need pages and pages of it but having things like your key professional certificate and exams with their dates um, any projects that you've done and courses that you've done which reflect your interests and probably the area that you're going to work. So, for example, if you've done a project as an ST3 on diabetes management amongst a particular mm. group of patients, and that group of patients is quite predominant in the area that you're working in post-qualification, that's really relevant. <laughs> so put those things in. Um, presentations and audits. Um, a bit about your past professional activities and practical skills and then your personal achievements and interests is also quite important because there might be a bit of an overlap between what practices are offering and what your own interests are. What would you say on top of that, Gandhi? What what other bits do you think? Make yeah, good so, so I, I definitely agree with having a list of the various things that people can do is important. Yeah. I think the other thing to remember is that most um, em employers, partners and stuff will assume that you can do the job okay yeah. you're, you're applying so, so you've got we the hope. qualifications yeah <laughs> so you've got the qualifications and you've done the works so that there's that assumption that you can do that and just having that in brief that's all you need to know yeah. you know? so you know that you've got your cct that you've got your certificates that's fine the key thing i'm looking for is that information about the person itself how are they going to fit into the practice have they got mm -hmm. interests that align or you know have they got values more importantly that align with what the practice are doing now a lot of that you're going to get from the interview but in order to get to the interview you know that needs to be weeded out in terms of which ones seem more approachable and which ones may not do as much and that's the key thing you need to show in your cv 
it's really important as well that you don't write pages and pages because to be honest, I'm not going to sit there and read it. You know, um, it needs to be concise. Think of it as your statement when you've applied for medical school. Yeah, but maybe a bit shorter. <laughs> um, and it's just simple questions about, you know, what is it about you that makes you different? Yeah. Um, why are you different as well? You know, is it your personality? Is it the way that you approach things? Is it, you know, how you want to approach the, the population as well? Have you got ideas even about what the community you can do with and stuff? And try and share some of that in your CV itself. You know, many people know I'm a board game geek. I put that down in every single CV I apply for, for any job, no matter what. Why? Because they're going to get that when they get me. So, you know, I'm not going to hide that. I don't want to try and misrepresent myself in any way. And actually, that's my personality. So, yeah. That was what I was, yeah. And I think actually for those of you that, again, whatever role you do post CCT, um, I think, Gandhi, you've mentioned quite an important thing. Every practice has its own culture. And actually, even though so I, I locum, but I'm very much part of the practices where I work and I do my regular ongoing sessions. So one of them before COVID would have like a bake off every year in the summer and everyone would get involved and you know, they like baking, I like eating cakes, so it's like a perfect relationship. And then in mm -hmm. others, there's like um, a friend of mine who's a salary GP, really into running, and she set up a running club at her practice because, mm -hmm. and it got everybody, you know, even those people that didn't really like run, but it just was a social, like on a Friday evening, they'd go do a little jog, have a run, then, you know, go for dinner or go for a coffee. And it was just a really nice way of bonding. And my husband's a um, partner, in a practice and they kind of splashed out on a nice coffee machine and you know for their practice and all their staff and kind of have a a morning meeting obviously before covid it was much easier to do it in a more sociable way but i think every practice has its own culture and there's no reason if you're going to locum there's no reason why you can't become part of that and again if you're looking for a salaried role it's really nice to find out what the culture is at that practice maybe you can create one yourself and add to it or maybe it's something that really reflects your own. Like imagine, and imagine if everyone you worked with was really into board games. You had like a, do you have like an annual, exactly. There you go, you can start something. <laughs> there you go. Right, so next thing we're talking about is finding work itself though. Um, yeah, sorry. so just, um, oh, oh, do you know what? I updated the slide, but I haven't, um, it's all right, I've got mine here. So just, if you go back one um, a minute, on the finding work. So I had a list on this other side, but I can talk about it. So a few things to think about when you're thinking about finding work. So there's lots of different ways to access work wherever, whichever area you're in. But what you want to think about is, do you want, um, what kind of work do you want? So do you want kind of ad hoc locum work? So you're in lots of different practices. Um, do you want more stable work? So if you're locuming, for example, do you want maternity locum? Do you want long-term locum? Do you want to do out of hours or urgent care or one-on-one work? What what is it that like kind of because that will that will really determine how you source work and kind of the 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 way in which you structure your working week and the amount of work you do. Because for some of you with small kids, you're really, you know. Uh, urgent care and out of hours is a really convenient one because you get to do all your parent stuff, you get to do the school run and then you get to work. So you just got to work out, okay, what, what kind of work do I want? What kind of hours do I want to work? The other thing to think about is, do you want active work or passive work? So active work is more like you initially put in the groundwork, you find practices might be near your gym, near your child's nursery. It might be local to your, you know, where you live. And that you do directly. Or it might be passive where you kind of sign up onto an agency or an app and just book work that way. Both have their kind of considerations. Um, I think after last year with the pandemic and a lot of locums who were quite dependent on third parties for work really felt um, the lack of control and the effect on their income being dependent on you know, say through agencies or third parties on work. So actually what was seen was a rise in more direct working where they didn't have to compete for jobs and they, they could really determine and have more control of their income. So that's something you need to think about as well. And there's no right or wrong, but I think definitely with my local manager, we enable both those things. So we enable you to add all your work, no matter where it's sourced from and centralize it, 
Plus, with our um, GP, like a national practice directory, just connect with every practice on your doorstep that you want to, and they can send you sessions as well. Um, mm. So it gives you control and a bit of both um, from that aspect. But I think when you're thinking about finding work as a newly qualified GP, connecting with the training practices on VTS is a great way of doing it. You know, just asking your VTS administrator to ping out an email, local WhatsApp groups, there's lots of different ways. I think the aim, a really good aim to have, which I think served me really well, was I wanted to find kind of continuity, but like-minded practices where I could really be an extended part of the team. And that, for me, gave me a lot more rewards, but like above and beyond the, oh, wait, great, I've got loads of locum work. It kind of meant I was part of a team, I was part of a community. I had, you know, I'd go to the significant event meetings if I wanted to, mm. that's the case. And I'd help the practice out. Like, you know, the practice manager would often mess with me saying, oh, yeah, like, this is happening. We're really, you know, can you help? And I'd be like, yeah, of course. And it, it was definitely a two-way thing. So, yeah, I think whichever way you do it, just look at all the options that are available to you and just think about kind of the way you want your career to be and the way the, the way you want to work. Definitely. I can see how MLM can also help with, like you said, about structuring kind of the workload that you then get from that. So, you know, yeah. of the timetable and stuff and then um, yeah. they say easily adding the location of the practices and that kind of stuff. Additional little tip I'll probably give you that is definitely have a chat with your local LMCs. Um, oh, definitely. Yeah. You know, yeah. Really good resource to try and find out yeah. what's going in, on in the area, as well yeah. as most LMCs will be really keen to have locum engagement because it's the one group they really yeah. struggle sometimes to, to capture with. So, so it will be a two-way relationship that will absolutely be a benefit and, and things. Yeah, no so, definitely. Let's move on to contracts, shall we? Yeah, so this is just a brief one, but I think essentially when you're working when you're working as a locum GP, a bit like when you work as a salary GP or partner, you have a contractual relationship in place already. And it's no different as a locum. Like you if you're working through an agency, you are working to the contract and the terms of that agency. So don't think, oh, I've booked the job, I, I can do what I want, because the, no, you, you, there will be things, and you know, I think last year with the pandemic, there was so, you know, so many locums saying, oh my God, like, I had all these sessions booked through this company, and they just cancelled everything, and actually, when I said to them, they said, no, no, in our terms and conditions, it says this, and they hadn't even thought of that as being, mm. a, as being an issue. When you work directly, you have also have to have some kind of contractual relationship in place with that practice, so if you want, you can download a, a template of terms and conditions off the resources section of My Local Manager. It's free. You can just use it for however you're working. And in it, it kind of stipulates just the backbone of good practice as a locum. Mm. So it's got things like, you know, each consultation should be minimum 10 minutes. Um, cancellation policy both ways for it because it is a two way relationship. I think... Um, I had like I've had really interesting questions on the VTS talks and workshops and conferences that I've done. And, you know, sometimes I think um, GPs are often worried, well, what if the practice cancel me? What if this happens? Or or and it's like, yeah, you know, that does sometimes happen. Like I've had that happen in the practices I work at, but it's a it's a relationship. So often they'll be like, look, I'm so sorry, Serena, the salary GP cancelled their leave, but I know they're gonna give me more sessions that so I don't say, well. The T's and C's you signed, right, when I first started with you, stipulate that da da da. It's, it is a bit of a give and take. But what you're trying to do with these is just protect both sides. So the practice manager knows you're not going to say five to nine, the morning you're supposed to be there. Oh, I'm not coming in because I'm getting paid more just working at the neighboring practice. You know, that's not going to happen. And also, they can, there's a, um, an agreement in place. So you know what work you're supposed to deliver and vice versa. And <clears throat> there's boundary set. So when you're working a session, if extras are going to be added, it's a pre-discussion. If a uh, practice is relying on you, they know you're going to bring your own gear. You're not going to walk out with all their, their equipment and never come back. It's just, you know, so have a look at those. But I think um, what I'm kind of trying to share with this is even when you're locuming, whether whichever way you're doing it, you have a contractual agreement in place, whether you know it or not. And it's important that you're aware what that agreement is and what the expectations are. And a very easy way of just clarifying that, especially when you're working directly for your practices, is just to have a set of T's and C's. And you don't have to send them to the practice each time, especially if you're working there recurrently. And it's a two-way conversation. So you say to the practice manager, are you happy with this? Is there anything you want to add? 
and you both sign it and it's and it's done and it's in place absolutely agree with that and uh, although i'm not locuming at the moment i haven't done for a couple of years um i do do other contractual work for you know with other parties and stuff and mm -hmm. absolutely having terms and conditions related to that and it's hopefully a situation where you never have to defer to them you know that that's yeah. a good relationship but at least if it's there it's something to reference to and at the very least yeah. if the worst situation happens something to fall back on to to make sure that actually you're treated fairly and, that, and yeah. that's the key thing it's about being treated fairly it's not about one person one side being yeah. more you know controlling than the other it's just mm. making it fair and like you say you know the cancellation ones are bonds I, I would highly recommend everyone who is out there locoming spends at least half a day just working out what is it you want from the whole process of locoming and, and that kind of stuff. Have a look at various templates out there. Like you say, you, you've got one. I've got one somewhere on my website as well. Lost track of where it is. But um, I mean, mine are more for the ones I've got for those that are looking at doing educational sessions, you know, because I've well, had situations yeah. where, you know, some people haven't paid me for educational mm -hmm. work I've already done. And then I just refer back to my terms and conditions and say, well, actually, you know, you're saying you're going to take now three months to pay me. It clearly states in my T's and C's, actually, you've got a couple of weeks to do so. And if you don't, unfortunately, charges go up after that point and you've agreed to those. Now, I'm happy to be flexible, but there's a difference between three months and three weeks kind of thing. So, yeah, you know, it's, exactly. you know agree. Flexibility is part of it. And sometimes things happen. You know, I, I worked at a practice when I was locoming where their cash flow had massively been changed by um, you know, PSE or NHS, as it was then called. Mm. And, you know, they hadn't been paid by the centre uh, on time. So therefore mm. they didn't have the money to pay me. And they came to me and they said simply, look, we're really sorry. We can't pay you on time. They've told us they're going to pay us a couple of weeks later. Are you all right to take your money a couple of weeks later? I was like, fair enough. You know, I'm not going to hold you over the coals for, you know, I've still got loads of sessions planned with you. Yeah. And it, it was my training practice as well. You yeah. know, I was, you know, it was reasonable. And, you know, fortunately I was in a situation where not having that money immediately was not an issue. Yeah. And if you're in a different situation, it'd be a bit more uncomfortable, but at the same time, it was that ongoing relationship that was still important to me and it was fine. So, and yeah, they paid me a, a week later because actually they did get paid by NHS England quicker. So it was sorted. Oh, but it's just it's thinking about those things before they become it's like anything it's like insurance you hope never to use it but when mm. you need it you, you're really thankful it's there yeah exactly so what questions to ask when it comes to booking a session i guess these are some of the key ones um yeah. talk us through it serena uh, and i'll chuck yeah it so i think just really if there's quite a simple format to that you might want to go through when you're thinking about how you want to work and you know so do you, do you want to do on call duty where you're there for half a day or the full day and you'll be doing your patients plus some admin plus some home visits and that is although some people are like oh no I don't want to do that I just want to see my patients especially like post qualification you learn a lot through that you know that whole experience of it and you it kind of keeps you on your toes and it keeps you um uh up to date with really how general practice is you can also just say no i just want to see my pre-book patients and that's fine but also it depends on what the practice needs so it is like i said a two-way conversation what you want to clarify like post cct is okay so i'm going to do these sessions at these practices it could be your training practice for example and you just say to them so what you know you do you want a pre-book session or is it on call and then then essentially the question is well what's the rate and i when i first started i would just ask the practice managers they're not going to most of them aren't just going to lowball you they use locums all the time they have their own you know they have their own fee that they pay and um and often the price is fair like you don't you know it's a fair price the only question you really want to ask them is is that including my pension or is pension on top and that's that's really the question that you really kind of need to need to work out um you might also want to ask and this is more like um if you're in, going to practice you don't really know um are you going to be the only doctor in the building um or are there going to be other people there which if you're newly qualified can be quite daunting um mm. are you aware of the prescribing formulary that's in place in the area and at the moment i think with covid the the standard operating procedure managing hot patients and cold patients most of us are working generically with we have our telephone and video list and then we have slots for face-to-face -face at the end um, 
at the end of our um, sessions, but you just want to be aware, okay, where's the PPE kept? If it is a, a potential COVID patient, how, what is the process in that area to manage it? Where are you diverting them to? So you're up to date. Mm -hmm. A bit about referrals. So, you know, um, most of us are you know, doing our own referrals and doing e-referrals, just what's the process for it? And handover is so important. I think yeah. the amount of times I've said this to, to people who said, oh, if I locum, I don't really need to, I just do it and go, right? And it's like, no, you are a clinician yep. seeing patients. You have a clinical duty to those patients. Therefore, if you've seen somebody, whether you're not going to be at that practice again, doesn't really matter. If you've seen someone that needs follow up or is a concern or you've put a plan in place for them to have urgent bloods and a review in 24 hours when you're not going to be there, that needs a handover so therefore just ask the practice before you start what's your handover process who do i task document everything but do do make sure when you've seen that patient or patients that need follow -up. it could be a child with a safeguarding concern for example if you've seen them regardless of whether you're going to be back there or not it's your responsibility as part of that chain to make sure the appropriate things happen and the way i ensure that is First of all, being aware what the handover process is in a practice. And if I want the patient to come back in 24 hours, for example, after they've had their urgent bloods and the results are back, who, who they're going to see and that they're booked in to see that person. And on every consultation at the end, I have plan written and I dot one, two, three, four, what my plan is for if the results are positive or negative or if whatever, whatever it is. So that the next GP seeing that patient is like that's what she was thinking and okay this hasn't th this has happened therefore i need to do this and there's a complete chain would you have any do you have any other thoughts on that um really? so definitely agree with the handover process and the, yeah. you know one of the hallmarks i would say of a good locum versus a normal locum is that willingness to engage with the practice to hand mm. over patients that yeah you know, particularly if you work in an area that is has challenging patients. So I work in yeah. the city Nottingham, one of the most deprived areas, that, you know, of, of the, the city itself. Mm -hmm. um, our patients are by nature complex um, and our even our more simpler ones are still complex by normal standards. So, you know, if a locum did a session and didn't really kind of contact me about some of the patients they may end up seeing, particularly if I've triaged those patients where they've been seeing them, yeah. I'd be surprised to be honest. I'd be expecting yeah. them to come back to me and say, either I'm not quite sure what to do with this one or can I have a chat about how we manage this case or I need this to happen. And, and you know, often I'll, I'll even direct it to, to some of them saying, you know, um, this may be something you need to think about because I know those patients relatively well. But if not, you know, handing over is really important and having that discussion. So often when we have locums, I'll always say to them, you know, I'm in room seven. If you want to come and have a chat with me, uh, happy to help and things. I guess yeah. the only thing I'd probably add on to your list is about systems themselves. So yeah. having a play with the various systems that, the practice yeah. you'd be using and we're going to see even more of that as more and more practices change to online consultations and use yeah. them because you may work in an area where okay fair enough it's predominantly system one or emis but every practice is now pretty much using a different online consultation platform and if you're being asked yeah. to engage in that in some way shape or form do you know yeah. how to do that do you know where to look all that kind of stuff so a bit of onboarding time that's something to consider as well and make sure that yeah. you know what systems they're using in practice to make their life easier but also your life easier so you're not stressed about it when you land in the practice yeah definitely great cool. Let, let's crack on then shall we so this one is tips for workload i think this is me isn't it this is you yeah so just as a bit of a background for this um a lot of trainees were saying that they're quite worried about managing workload and having like a good system in place and you know kind of tips on how, how to do that and i was like well, I'm always running late, so ask Andy. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go through this in, in its basic form. Um, okay. And that's purely simply because I don't think we've got time to do this in its fullest depth because we've still got loads to cover. So I'm going to whistle through it. But if okay. you do want to check out some of the links in this, so if you're watching us on the YouTube channel or, or whatever, if you have a look in the description, you'll see loads of links in particularly into some of the more detailed episodes I've done on this particular topic. And if you're watching on Facebook, we'll just go up look at the YouTube description and stuff. It's over there. But I guess a um, key thing I always say about is the three P's. If you want to be more productive in practice, focus on the three P's. OK, so the first one is something called Pomodoro technique. And um, so this is a, a concept in terms of being more productive. And it's this principle that actually your brain can only concentrate for a fixed length of time before it starts wandering and it needs a break. 
So there's various different versions of this. I like the Pomodoro one. Um, so it's basically this principle of you can do 25 minutes worth of work and then you need to have a five minute break to change the way that your brain is working and stuff. Now, in general practice, this is a little bit trickier, okay? Because patients don't fit into a nice little you know, 10 minute box or a 15 minute box and structuring your clinics to work around this will be difficult. However, your admin time, your pathology time, those kind of tasks, those admin based tasks, those you can easily fit into this kind of mechanism. It's basically like I say, you do 25 minutes of work and then you have a five minute break. Brief, short, but actually by doing that, you're more refreshed, you're more able to deal with the work itself rather than just carrying on, carrying on, carrying on. You know, I'll give you an example. So, so in our practice, we do triage clinic lists and, and I do quite a few of them um, because I work quite a lot in the practice. And, you know, those clinics can, some, particularly lately, you know, you can have 50, 60 odd patients on there. And sometimes the impetus is, oh, I just, I'm just going to get through it. I just need to get through that whole list. Mm. Actually, five minute break after doing about, I normally do about five or six of them, quick five minute break, go to the loo, go grab a cup or whatever, and make sure I do that. And I have a timer going on in the background to remind me to do that. I still get through those lists generally quicker than most of the other people when they're, when they're doing it. And I've noticed when I've done it without doing that, when I've just cried, yeah, it takes me a lot longer because you slow down. You're not as fresh. You're not as, you yeah. know, you know, so Pomodoro technique, really recommend it. If you want a timer for general practice, you can do it with me. So I've actually created one and there's a link down below to help you with that. Parkinson's law. So Parkinson's law, we're not talking about the, the condition. We're talking about the law itself. And that's that whatever task that you have, um, however much time you give to it, the task will expand to fill in that time. OK, so if you set an hour for a meeting, that meeting will take an hour. Yeah. If you set half an hour for a meeting, that meeting will still only take half an hour because you'll finish it. So whatever task you're trying to do, give it the appropriate length of time that, you know, actually, that's what I can do it in, not an arbitrary amount of time. Mm. The consultation is a great example of that. We have a 10 minute consultation and we try and fit everything in. Yeah. It doesn't always work, though, does it? So, but when you're trying to do other kind of work, you know, um, if you have to write an essay, for example, if you've got three weeks to do it, how often is it that you do most of that in the last couple of days? Yeah? Yeah. You've got three weeks to do an essay, but actually you're spending, majority of people probably do it in the last couple of days. And it's recognizing that you don't need as much time as you think you do to do most tasks. So what is the minimum amount of time you actually need? And that's what you do. And then more importantly, that's what you put on your schedule so that you know in your head, actually, I'm going to be doing my results and my pathology. I'm going to give myself 25 minutes and I have to do it in that 25 minutes. OK, mm -hmm. and actually, you'll find more often than not, you pro if, you, if you genuinely engage with trying to do it, you will do it in that time rather than doing it for a few minutes, going off, have a break, going on Facebook, going on the check my emails, all that kind of stuff. Focus on the task itself. And the Pareto principle. So this is this pr principle that 20 percent of your workload will actually take up 80 percent of your time. OK, so and you see this in various different areas. You can talk about this with patients, you know, generally speaking, 20 percent of our patient list will take up majority of the practice time because of the contacts and stuff. And it's exactly the same with the workload. There's going to be certain mm -hmm. tasks that you do that will take you so much longer to do because they are that much more complex. But it's actually only a really small part of your workload. Yeah. So how can you figure out to make that 20 percent more efficient? Because from that 20 percent, if you even have a one or two percent gain in terms of how productive you can be, that magnifies by your time, you know, by four, you know, fourfold and stuff. So try and work mm -hmm. out those. particular, And, and they, they're they always going to be individual to yourself. You know, everyone has different things that they find more challenging. I'm going to cover those in a second. So next up, we've got two, three or four. So these are three rules I recommend everyone has a consideration of and the ways of trying to prioritize the work that you do. So number one is the two minute rule. Um, generally speaking, if you have a task that comes your way, if you can deal with it within two minutes, you do it there and then. OK, don't leave it till later. Don't come back to it. If you can do it in under two minutes, just do it. Get it out the way. And the reason why we'll come to that in the Eisenhower Matrix a bit later on. But one of the other things to remember is that generally speaking, there are various different things that we like to do and various things that we don't like to do. And this is where the concept of something called the three frogs comes along. So this is actually a story by Mark Twain. 
um, and he it's been adapted and it's probably me not doing it verbatim and stuff. Um, but imagine if I said to you, Serena, right now, I'm going to give you three frogs right in front of you on your dinner plate. Um, and if you don't eat those three frogs, you're going to die. You've been poisoned and you have to eat them. OK, which of those three frogs are you going to eat first? What's the difference between the three frogs? Like the only difference you want. Yeah. Not, no, well, they may be bigger, they may be small, yeah. maybe I don't know any, I, any of them if I have to, I'd just like, yeah. Okay. So the principle of three frogs is you take the biggest, fattest, ugliest one. Okay. And the reason for that is once you've got that bad boy down, the others, by comparison, are going to be a doddle, aren't they? <laughs> I've done the worst part. You've got the worst one down. So the others are easier by comparison. Yeah. That's very true, actually. Yeah. yeah it's, it, that first step is always the hardest, isn't it? Yeah. So once you've done that, after, yeah, and it's exactly the same with the way that we do things. So I'm sure there are various tasks out there that, you know, our colleagues find really, yeah, I just don't want to do it. I just don't want to do it. Or I'll put it off to the last minute because I know that it's, it's just making me feel, ugh. But yeah. The downside to that is then you're spending the entire time at work or your day or everything else thinking mm. about it. It's at the back of your mind, I've still got to do it. Or more importantly, you've done everything else and now you're coming to it a little bit more tired, a little bit less fresh compared to if you've done it first. Whereas if you've done it first, it's out of the way and the rest of the day is so much easier by comparison. Yeah, you've got that victory, you've got that thing out of the way. And that's where the principle of three frogs is. And again, if you want to relate that to patient loads, you know, the patient that you know is going to cause you some challenges. You know, some people call them heart sinks, some people call them other things. Actually, Get them out the way because it's easier for you because then the rest of the day, theoretically, should be easier. Yeah. Mm, very true. Yeah. So last one, Eisenhower's Matrix. So Eisenhower, um, is, uh, former president of the United States, you know, distinctly possibly better one than some of the we've had more recently and things. But one of the amazing things he came up with was this matrix of ideas. And it's this principle of, you know, um, urgency versus... Oh, I've forgotten it now. In fact, I've got it on the next slide, so I'm going to have to remind me. There we are. Urgency. Oh, yeah, yeah. Urgent, not important. Yeah. yeah. And basically, you stick things into these four categories. So you've got your urgent and important. You've got your urgent and not important. You've got your not urgent and your important. And you've got your not urgent and your not important. And basically, spend a bit of time, all the various things that you're doing, stick them into these boxes. Now, first rule, you can't put everything into the urgent, important box. Because if you're doing that, meh. It's a bit pointless. Um, but the reason for doing that, so anything that's urgent and important, you kind of have to do it and you have to do it there and then as quickly mm -hmm. as possible. Yeah. All right. So that's and that a lot of stress, doesn't it? When we're living in that urgent, important and that everything you've got to do now, it's hugely stressful. Yeah. <laughs> and the reality is everything doesn't go in that box. Yeah. Sit down and think about it. You know, it doesn't. So there are going to be some things that, are, you know, they're not urgent, but they are important. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, the first day you get that coroner's report, for example, you've still got two weeks to do it. Yeah, it's possibly going to be on your mind, but it's not imminent that you have to do it. But you definitely need to make sure you've got some time scheduled to mm -hmm. dedicate to that to get it done. And then, you yeah. know, at that time I'm going to sort it out, you know. Yeah. Then you've got your um, urgent, but it's not really important. It's, it doesn't necessarily need you to do it. Well, that's stuff that you can delegate. Yeah. Mm. And this can be, you know, filing your, um, you know, your results. This can be actually certain prescriptions and that kind of stuff, writing your letters, that kind of, yeah. you know, those kind of things, you know, they, they may need to be done, but do they have to be done by you? Yeah. No. And then you've got your not urgent, not important box. So this is your elimination. This is the stuff that absolutely should be done by somebody else. Um, and you need to figure out what those are within your working day. And I would really recommend doing this with the, within the practice itself because you'll often find loads of people come with similar answers and that's when you get the proper gains in the practice and stuff. Mm. Yeah. So just to finish off this set, set about um, workload and stuff, a couple of quick tips um, for those in practice. So first of all, automate what you can. The systems can help you do this. Um, many of you know I'm a system one nut and I love this stuff and it will help. Um, and definitely got some tools and tips for that, um, particularly in our System One Facebook conference coming up at the end of June. If you want to join us, there's links down below for that. To relieve your stress, um, a couple of things. So number one, use a calendar booking system. So I know MLM kind of has this built into it. Yeah. If for some reason you don't want to use MLM. 
Um, Harmonizely is the one I would recommend. It's the one I use for my um, non-clinical work and all that kind of stuff that I book in and things. Um, mm. So, you know, it just means I don't have to worry about double booking myself on my free. I just send people the link. You want my time? Here's when I'm available. Book it in and we'll get it sorted from there. So much less stress from that. Passwords. Use a password manager. If you are not using a password manager, you won't know how much stress-free your life can be until you've got one. I need to get one. Yeah, not having to worry about what password do I need to use? Where did I keep it? Am I on, you know, version 6.3.72 because yeah. of all the weird characters and stuff I have to use? Do I need to create it? Makes life so much easier. Um, and there's loads of really good free options out there. I pay for mine because I like some of the extra stuff it gives me. Um, and it saves me more time by doing that. But to be honest, use one. It will make your life so much easier. And keyboards. Um, so, again, people know I love my keyboards. There's some awesome things you can do with a proper, decent keyboard, particularly macros and that kind of stuff. So time-saving little hacks and stuff. Um, but you need a proper keyboard and not one of the stock Dell ones that unfortunately don't do really nice things and stuff. And it's so much more comfortable using a proper keyboard. If you're a locum, do you want one? Well, actually, USB, you know, sticking it into the computer and it will work straight away. And if not, just use the cable because it will definitely work directly from that. And having mm -hmm. one ones that where you can put the keystrokes and stuff built into the keyboard itself, mm -hmm. so you're not having to worry about software issues and stuff. Seriously, your own kind of like um, things you can carry around. Some really cool things coming out soon about that. So definitely have a look at that. And timers, less relevant for locums, but if you do like to be the type of person that sticks on time, there's a couple of cool timers that I would recommend, particularly the time cube. It's a great way of keeping to time, which we're not doing so well at, if I'm being honest, Serena. So we've got loads to get through. Okay, yeah, that's true. Um, just a quick thing on automation. So, and your urgent important matrix. So a lot of GPs, when they're starting as locums, get really bogged down with the whole, oh, I've got to book my session, then I've got to invoice, then I've got a pension, I've got to do the calculations, and I've got to make sure I don't double book shifts. And essentially, my local manager automates all of that whole process for you, so you don't have to do multiple things at the same time. And I think the key importance of that, especially when you're pensioning, is those pension forms have to be in at a certain time. So getting them automatically generated after you've literally just added your booking is a huge time saver and brain saver as well. So very quickly, we can actually, so these are just common questions from the finances side that people say, how often should I invoice? What should I charge? How do I pension? I've got a guide that will be in the show notes that goes through this, but just very quickly, because we've got so much to get through. People generally invoice uh, at the end of the month. You create an invoice, ping it out to the practice, they pay you, and then you create your pension forms. Um, pensioning is in the guide, and actually my local manager automates that whole pension process for you. So we'll put the link in the guide, uh, the guide in the link, and then you can look it up from there. And you can find accountants and financial advisors and everything else through our partners on MLM. You just message us and we link you up. Okay, next slide. So next slide, um, pay. Um, so you're talking about oh, this. So we talked a bit about this, yeah. So you can yeah. probably go. Um, you can go to the next slide uh, from this because I've talked about the guide and pension, the guide. So again, that will all be covered in the bit. So now, yeah. so telehealth tips. This is for you, Gandhi, because obviously we're doing using so many this new systems. Yeah. Okay. Help. So whistle stop <laughs> tour. Okay. So first thing, preparation. Okay. You're going to get the, the, the gist. That I, I like my short kind of things and stuff, but preparation simply first, you need to prepare yourself for the kind of work that you're going to be doing. So, you know, are you dressed appropriately? And why do I say that? Well, if you're doing video consultations, you need to be wearing clothing that's sensible because people are going to be looking at you and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but where are you going to be when you're doing that? You're doing that from your practice. You're doing that from your home. Are you in a quiet area? All these kind of things you need to think about, about place and, and that kind of stuff. Is the internet connection stable enough? You know, that's one of the key stresses many people didn't realize when they started doing remote working in particular. Oh, my gosh, I need a decent internet connection. Otherwise, it doesn't work. VPNs, all that kind of stuff. Sort it out before you start working. Have a dry run. Make sure you can connect to the systems because otherwise oh gosh that's stress and it's stress you don't want to deal with in terms of yourself you know how are you going to be functioning for the day itself you know are you ready to get cracking and what kind of stuff is it that you need to deal with at that point point? and then time you know again 
are you ready beforehand to get started when you're meant to be seeing your patients and stuff? Are you saying in terms of the workload that you do and how much time are you actually going to allocate to the way that you're going to be doing these kind of consultations? So things we often think about is, you know, the time it takes to do a consultation. Loads of people talk about this, but, you know, um, if I've got an online consultation that converts to a telephone, then gets converted to a video, that can go to face to face. To be honest, why were you doing that? If it was clearly evident that you were heading that direction, why don't you just go online to face to face in the first place? Save yourself so much more stress rather than having to worry about those different things. How are you going to schedule that in if it's a further one? You know, all these kind of things that Serena mentioned about understanding the way that the practice works. Learn that beforehand. Don't do it in the moment because you're going to feel so much more stressed, to be honest. And we're here to try and help reduce your stress for that. Yeah, definitely. I like to talk a little bit about video consultations. So a couple of things, and this is applicable a lot of it to telephone as well. Um, but my top tips are always be the host, okay? Um, help understand how that consultation is going to work, whether that's video, whether that's telephone, explain the process and stuff. Um, for video in particular, I have a bit of a spiel that I give to patients when I'm changing them from telephone to video. And why do I do that? Because I know that by onboarding them properly, it's more likely to be successful and I can have a better video consultation with the patient. More importantly, they're more inclined to do it again if they have a good experience rather than here's a link, off you go, done, which is what I know some of my colleagues do at times, you know, across various different practices and things. They'll send the patient a link and expect them to understand how to do a video consultation. They don't. So you need to onboard them properly. ID and privacy check. We've talked about this in our previous session about how important the privacy check is, you know, in terms of making sure the patient's OK to talk. Um, you know, is the patient on a bus? Is the patient in, patient in a checkout line? And you're about to ask them about their, you know, PV swabs that have come back showing that they've got chlamydia. Is that going to be a really sensible situation? No. Even if the patient thinks it's a sensible situation to talk about and that has happened. No. You don't want to be talking about that stuff in that environment. So saying, actually, it's not safe for us to continue. We're going to have to reschedule this or I can call you back after I've done another quick call in that time. Please make sure you're somewhere a bit more private. You know, those are the kind of things you need to be aware of because you still have responsibility about how that patient manages their health care in that sense. You can't say to them 100 percent it's all on you um, because you're still giving that information. Yeah. Mm. Golden time. Um, I generally have a rule that any consultation I have with a patient, I give them a little bit of time just to talk about things, you know, and that can be various different things. I find telephones, 30 seconds is most people can talk about without any form of interruption. And if you find it that they, they're not stopping and you want to just literally go quiet, very few people can keep talking when they've got absolutely no responses coming back from them for more than about 30 seconds or a minute. Um, so it's a really good tactic to get the nub of the issue but then also making sure that you run in a timely way. And absolutely, this is one of the things I teach a lot of my trainees as well. Listen to what they're saying. Don't be going off doing all the various different things like checking their notes and all that kind of stuff. And just literally listen for a few short, you know, for a minute or two, because they will give you so much information often that you're then not asking the same questions back to the patient or you're not having to go, you know, you're not going back to them about, oh, what about this? What about, you know, you then yeah. get formulaic process in your brain about checking off the things as yeah. they've already told you you're just double backing on the time so it's understanding how you do that um, look at the camera if you're doing video consultations um, if not explain why and that's really simply because if you're not looking at the camera you're looking somewhere else and it leads to an empathy element it leads to a disconnect and stuff um, but at least if you can't look at the camera then you know say that you're not doing it um, don't eat and drink absolutely important and more importantly than anything, understand how you can manage interruptions. I've had to do streams where people have interrupted me and I, you know, I have a big, huge thing on the side so that hopefully nobody can just walk on camera, for example, when I'm doing them. Various other things in practice when you're on telephones, how are people going to contact you when you need it and stuff. And understand the various different types of examination that you can do remotely. Um, I've got a whole load of videos on that from chest exams, from limb exams, all that kind of stuff to help you understand how you can do various different things you know, additionally. And just finishing off, um, summarize for the patient okay because remote consultations in particular it's so much harder for patients to go away understanding what's happened because they don't have that face-to-face -face element as yeah. well to understand the information you've just shared with them and as a result of that most people don't remember as much so use the resources to help you you know sms is great you can text links you can send them that kind of stuff but make sure that plan is stepwise absolutely go through it and chunk and check um, it's simple principles. But when you do them, it makes that process of sharing information so much more effective.
Um, and I love to have loads of resources available to me. So I mentioned shortcuts, I mentioned using the systems themselves. So, you know, text expanders, macros, auto console, whatever you want to call them, all the systems have different names for them. Have those ready so it makes your life quicker and easier so you're not having to do things. I just created one where I can type in a, a set a few pieces of um, information to the patient's notes and it'll automatically send a task to my reception to book that patient in for a pharmacist review, okay? I don't have to do those extra five steps of open mm -hmm. task, write task, send task, allocate to the right group. I've done that. You know, it's an automatic little thing that happens when I type those words in about that patient needing a pharmacist review. I've just knocked off about 30 seconds of my time for every medication review I now need to do where they need to come in. And that may not sound like a lot because you know, I probably have about what, 15, 20 of those a day over a week. I've just saved myself nearly half an hour worth of time. Yeah, no, definitely. And and yeah. it's that compound gains you get. Yeah. So, um, MLM. So, for those of you that are going to be starting off as locums, we've covered quite a few tips on things you need to think about and how to get started. Um, you can sign up to MLM and get all the automation and all the benefits from it, plus wraparound support as well. Um, if you go to the next slide... So just a little bit about the kind of support that we offer. So um, we have partnerships with um, Redwell, with Headspace, with um, Chase Devere, who are BMA approved financial advisors. And we kind of offer a lot of the added support as locums that you will need as a self-employed GP, not just clinical updates, but also finding a mortgage, getting a good accountant, tips on tax, all those things. And you get monthly live webinars with CPD. Um, Gandhi, you've been on one of ours. You did our mm -hmm. remote consulting and stuff. Yeah, so they're really popular, often oversubscribed, but you know, it kind of just really helps kind of create a really cohesive community and somewhere where you can get all the information. So if you're gonna be locoming, you can access lots of support that way. Great, next slide. So last couple of tips you got for me is some tech tips yeah. just yeah. to try and make that practice a little bit easier. Um, so people always ask me about med tech. Um, mm. And I think a um, couple of things I like to mention, and again, I'm going to cover these in brief. So there's loads of links in the, the description below to give you more detail on this. First thing I definitely recommend, if you want to invest in a bit of time, a bit of money into having a decent piece of med tech, have a decent stethoscope. The one I would really recommend is something called the Echo Core 2. Um, so it's a Bluetooth stethoscope. Um, and, you know, there's that whole adage about you stick Bluetooth on anything nowadays, you know. Mm -hmm. Actually, on a stethoscope, it's pretty awesome. The sound quality is so much better because of the noise cancelling elements that they've put into them. Mm, and okay. Literally, the way I can describe it to you is like going from watching normal definition TV to watching high definition TV, but for your ears. Okay. <laughs> And, and literally the amount of quality that you can get from listening with a proper stethoscope that mm. has that technology built into it. Yeah. And there are other things you can do. So, you know, one of the other things I recommend is people using them in care homes to transmit the sound from patients in care homes so you don't physically have to be around them. I know loads of places when hot clinics were massively needed, we yeah. used this kind of tech to get patients to put them on and then transmit the side to the other side of a room so then, that you know, people weren't having to be too close for the examination. Yeah. Of COVID and like that. So there's real benefit there. Um, I'm a big fan of endoscopes. So I've got a little camera endoscope I keep in my clinic room. And when I look in people's ears, sometimes, you know, uh, I will show the patient what I'm seeing, particularly if they're not believing what I'm telling them about them not having an infection or actually having an infection. Sticking it on screen just makes my life a bit easier. It takes a couple of seconds to do. Um, and, you know, they're not expensive pieces of kit. I know people are now looking at things like telemedicine and dermoscopy. Just done a session with Dr. Chin Wybrew on that in terms of how to do dermoscopy easily, quickly, and what kind of kit you need to consider. So feel free to check those out. I think wearables, we're going to see a lot more happen in practice. You know, across the country now, we've got um, SATS monitor programs, you know, mm. that people are using for post-COVID management. We're actually, we're going to see more of that. Blood pressure monitoring is going to become yeah. more and more of what we do and there's going to be additional stages that happen from that as well including near patient testing whether that's bm monitoring obviously things like the um uh, libra devices are you know revolutionizing the way we manage certain conditions mm. well all the things are going to be coming so you know being aware of these and how you balance those in your consultations how you take that information in your consultations is stuff you need to know uh, and mm. you know it's going to become more and more of a feature of our practice in terms of actual kit, the first and main thing that I think every GP must, must, must have is a smartphone, okay? 
If you don't have one, please go get out and get one. I don't care which one it is, although preferably not Apple, but you didn't hear me say that. Um, but effectively, I love my Apple. I can't use anything else. <laughs> the smartphones allow you to use so much, particularly apps, okay? The number one app that I think every clinician must have on their phone is the BNF, okay? Yeah, I agree with you, actually. Hands yeah. down, the best medical app available in the UK because it's just got the information you need. And then I know some people say, well, I don't need it. I've got the clinical systems. Why, why do I need to have it? What about when you're out on your visit? What about when you're locating in a practice and you don't know where they keep their formulary, you know? All those kind of yeah. things that sometimes it's just handy to have and it's a useful thing. And being able to switch from the adult to the child BNF in literally the flick of a yeah. switch so much nicer in particular there's loads of other cool things out there i'm big fan of orca an organization for review care of health uh, applications um so that's where you can send applications to patients it's kind of like the bnf for health applications and i use lots of apps with patients in terms of helping them understand how to manage and support their care and it's also got a camera which obviously having a camera is just awesome tip for that um if you particularly if you're doing patient-based images don't use the camera app directly use an app that takes the photos for you. So things like um, Pando, um, Forward, um, uh, Silo, that kind of stuff, because they keep the images contained in a data safe mm -hmm. format rather than it being on your actual yeah. phone, which is an IG breach if you did that, being aware of that. Um, learn to type quicker. So I talked about keyboards already, but one of the best skills a GP can have is actually being able to type quicker because you'll be able to do your work faster. And if you want to, the tools on that, there's things like Keybar, great websites to have a look at, Type Racer, that kind of stuff. They're games you can play, whilst, and they teach you to type quicker. And if you don't like typing, dictaphones. I, I've always been a little bit anti-dictaphones, but I must admit um, some of the newer tech that they've got in there makes them pretty damn awesome, to be honest, um, and highly would suggest that, if, particularly if you're the type of person that doesn't like typing, a dictaphone will save you so much time. And lastly, just on learning... Yeah. Just a quick one. Do you have a video on how to set up things like macros um, for the clinical IT systems that um, we could so, share yeah, in I've the corners? got a couple. Um, they're all on my System 1 playlist. Um, so okay, unfortunately, yeah. it's all System 1 based because I don't use EMIS. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, definitely we're looking at getting some more stuff and things Great. to help with that. Um, podcasts, best way to learn in my view. I, I'm a person that learns by listening. So I love people talking to me and that's how I pick up information. And I think podcasts are the best way to learn things because it's a great opportunity for you to use your dead time. And more importantly, and I've just told Serena this hack before we started, you can stick it on 1.25 speed, you can stick it on yeah. 1.5 speed, so you can go through things so much more quicker. Same mm. with vlogs. I teach people how to do Epley's maneuver through YouTube videos, you know? I mm most people across general practice how to do something or other through my videos because that's how people love to learn you know so use it you know, take that learning from other places youtube is one of the best learning resources in the world right now so why not take yeah, advantage of it true. and definitely consider online conferences and i mentioned obviously upcoming we've got our own first system on facebook um group that we've got at the end of june which you're more than welcome to jump in and join us and if you want the link for that it's down below right hey. finishing off Serena. Yeah, so we'll put lots of useful resources in the notes of this webinar on YouTube that you can access. And um, all the other bits I talked about, so the CV template and everything, it's on the, so my local manager forward slash resources, you can just download all those things from there. And you can access our guide from our homepage as well. But we will share a link for that in the notes as well. Are there any other, any other resources that you can think of that we can share? Um, I think there's loads of other opportunities out there. I know we've had a question come through from the chat. So this is from Thivani that was asking more about that interesting thing about keyboards. I mentioned yeah. all about the smart cards. So two yeah. things with that. Unfortunately, most uh, commercial keyboards, you're right, they won't have a smart card reader in unless they are the, the stock kind of Dell ones we get. So you could either have a separate card reader that you use on a separate USB, um, so you can access that, or just leave the old keyboard in stick your smart card in, stick your keyboard cable into it, and then just use your keyboard. I mean, that's what I do um, because, okay. you know, that makes life easier. However, soon to happen, we are going to move towards digital smart cards. So actually you won't yeah. need a smart card at that point. Yeah. And when that happens, I think a lot of people will feel more easier. However, when that happens, make sure you've got your password manager because <laughs> you don't want to forget the passwords for that yeah absolutely don't forget to have that otherwise you're going to really struggle uh, you know the passwords and stuff is a major issue for that kind of thing yeah brilliant yeah we did so, it just 
Yeah, <laughs> so lots of content in there. Feel free to go back and have a look at some of the stuff that we've covered already if you want to. You're more than welcome to do that and stuff. And obviously, as, as Serena mentioned, down below in the show notes, in the description and stuff, I've already put loads of resources, including my local manager's websites there. We'll stick in the additional ones that she's mentioned uh, afterwards so you can access them dead easily. Definitely have a look and feel free to check out any of the other content that's there for you as well. Any last words, Serena? Um, my last words would be um, just for those of you CCTing over the course of this year, just enjoy it. Hopefully this has been really useful to get you guys get confident about starting. But there's a huge amount of resources out there. So you're, you're never alone. And I think um, enjoy, enjoy your next, next chapter in your, in your careers. Absolutely. If you do want to check out any of the other content, so I've got a couple of videos that you definitely want to check out. And th this one particularly coming up right here is the one that gives you all the ideas about the kind of kit you might want to have, particularly if you're starting off locoming and stuff. Or some of you, I'm sure YouTube is recommending another one right about here for you that you may want to have a look at. And as always, we're here to help tech enhance your primary care and learning. And we'll catch you in the next episode. See you later, guys. Bye.